The 1980s were a tough time for American car lovers. Government-mandated corporate average fuel economy standards forced large familial land yachts into downsized dinghies. Whereas eight cylinders were formerly the norm, now four- and six-cylinder powered vehicles became increasingly common, and the transition to front-wheel drive was in full swing across the industry. It was during this time that GM introduced its extremely popular A-body cars, the Chevrolet Celebrity, Pontiac 6000, Ohl's Cutlass Sierra, and Buick Century. These vehicles became so mainstream and accepted that the basic body style soldiered on from its introduction in 1982 to its demise in 1996. Introduced as an intermediate sized update to GM's compact X cars, the A-body sported numerous powertrains under hood, including venerable ones like the 2.2-liter and 2.5-liter four-cylinder engines, Chevrolet's 2.8-liter 60-degree V6, which, by the way, was originally introduced in the all-new X-Cars in 1980, the Buick 3.8-liter engine, and even an Oldsmobile-sourced 4.3-liter V6 diesel. However, there's one powertrain that stands out in infamy, among the early A-bodies, and that was only offered from 1982 to 1985. And it's not the Oldsmobile V6 diesel. It's instead the Buick 3.0 liter, 181 cubic inch, LK9 carbureted six-cylinder engine. Admittedly, this powertrain was also offered in the 1985 Buick Electra and Olds 98 for just one year, before becoming fuel-injected in 1986 and then dropping from the C-body lineup after that. But those C-body cars equipped with the LK9 V6 were so rarely equipped with it that its placement within them has been cast into the historical dustbin. Now, before someone questions me on how this engine could make it on such a list, particularly given the same engine family spawned the legendary 3800 series engine, let me just say that this 3-liter V6 shares relatively little in common with the admittedly excellent 1988 and later 3800 series V6 engines. And bear with me while I explain a little bit about the engine, its history, and its shortcomings. Now, the LK9 carbureted 3-liter V6 was launched in the 1982 model year, and it found its home under the hood of just the Buick Centuries and the Olds Cutlass Sierra in the A-body lineups that year while the remaining A-body cousins, the Celebrity and Phoenix, had to make do with Chevrolet's 2.8 V6 as their range-topping engine. The 3-liter V6 was derived by modifying the so-called even-firing 3.8-liter engine, this is the pre-3800 3.8-liter engine, to have a stroke of just 2.66 inches while retaining the same 3.96-inch bore. 3-liter V6 made 110 horsepower at 4,800 RPM and 145 foot-pounds of torque at 2,000 RPM. Neither figure was all that much more powerful than the standard Iron Duke 2.5-liter four-cylinder, which put out a little over 90 horsepower and 134 foot-pounds of torque and was fuel-injected and very reliable. And herein lies the first issue with the 3-liter LK9 V6, its power band or lack thereof. Having personally driven the 3-liter V6 and Chevrolet 2.8-liter V6 in the A-bodies, I can definitively state that the 2.8 engine feels peppier in these cars, despite nearly identical horsepower and torque ratings. More specifically, the 2.8 was rated at 112 horsepower and 145 pound-feet of torque. So again, despite very, very similar horsepower and torque ratings, the 2.8-liter V6 honestly is a nice little rever and a gem of an engine in these and other cars that it was fitted in in the in 1980s. When you step on the 2.8, it makes nice noises, keeps pulling all the way up until about 5,000 RPMs, which is admittedly low by today's standards, but good for the time. And the engine really never feels like it's unhappy when pressed. The 3-liter V6, by contrast, provides an entirely different oral as well as sensational experience. And as I previously mentioned, it's effectively a D-stroke even firing 3.8 V6, which itself was based on the Buick 215 cubic inch V8 introduced in 1961, hence the engine's 90 degree V-bank angle. 
The even firing 3.8 was introduced in the late 1970s and contained numerous features that were implemented in an attempt to smooth what was a very rough running engine due to the fact that it was based on a V8 engine versus being a clean sheet design like the Chevrolet 2.8 V6. These modifications included splitting the common crankshaft pins and offsetting them 30 degrees, enabling each cylinder to be fired at equal 120 degree rotations of the crankshaft. It was a great cost-effective idea to help tame an otherwise crude engine, but it did come with a number of trade-offs. The first is that the flange required to separate the crank pins required the engine's connecting rods to be placed off-center from the middle of the piston. This in turn necessitated the use of heavier full-skirt pistons to prevent the pistons from cocking in their bores and higher-tension piston rings to prevent blow-by. The net effect of this decision to implement the even-firing V6 version of the 3.8 engine and consequently the later 3.0-liter engine was a somewhat smoother running engine at most engine speeds, but also an engine that did not like to rev and one with unnatural forces on the internals due to its design. GM would later significantly improve on the even-firing V6 with the 3,800 engine's introduction in 1988, and the major improvements came by smoothing that engine with a balance shaft and staggering the engine's cylinder bank so that the rods could be placed in the middle of the pistons again, enabling lighter weight non-full skirt pistons to be employed and eliminating many unnatural forces on the engine's internals. In any case, as a result of GM's decisions, this 3-liter even firing V6 was neither the rever that the 2.8 Chevrolet V6 was, nor was it as durable as many of these engines suffered disastrous consequences, most notably connecting rod failures at relatively low mileage. This issue was further compounded by a rather poor oil pump and circulation design, which hastened the timing of the failures. And despite the so-called even firing nature of the engine, it was still rather crude in operation, particularly in the fast idle rev range of about 1,000 to 1,200 RPMs, where it would still emit pronounced shake in the cabin. If you happen to be one of the lucky ones who got your 3-liter V6 to last to around 100,000 miles or more, then you faced another issue, and that was the timing gear, which was a phenolic gear, shedding a tooth and causing the timing chain to stop rotating the valves. That happened on a number of these, and even on the 3.8 liter engines that did make it to about the 100,000 mile mark. And beyond issues with the bottom end of these engines, other topside electronics, including the electronically controlled E2ME Rochester carburetor, proved relatively troublesome, not only from a drivability perspective, but also from a diagnosis perspective, as the miles of vacuum hose and relatively novel electronics made it tough even for qualified technicians to locate and fix issues. It also didn't help that the engine's 90-degree bank angle forced it to be relatively crammed into the A-body's underhood area. Fortunately, by 1985, General Motors realized that this engine was unloved by customers as well as service technicians, and GM dropped the engine and replaced it with the Chevrolet 2.8 liter V6 across the lineup in the A-bodies, as well as an optional 3.8 liter V6. So if you happen to be the lucky owner of one of these 3 liter equipped A-bodies, what can you do to preserve your engine? Well, the first tip I would say is to not push the engine hard. Just drive the car normally. Don't do a lot of extended full throttle pulls and keep the engine RPMs relatively low. There's no tachometer in these cars, but for those who are familiar with vehicles, you know by sound how fast the engine is turning. And I would recommend keeping it under about 3000 RPMs. Don't force the engine to do full throttle upshifts as the transmission goes through gears. The second tip would be to make sure that you change the oil at very frequent intervals maybe even before 3,000 miles, something like 2,500 mile mark, so that the engine oil is very clean and can flow readily. And I would also advise, if it's possible, not to start the engine on super cold days unless you switch to a thinner weight oil, which can circulate around the engine when it's cold a lot better. So you may want to, if you're planning on driving these vehicles in the winter, Change to a lighter weight oil for that time period if the temperature is going to be, let's say, below freezing for an extended period of time. Switch to 5W30 and then switch back to 10W30 in the summers. may even want to try a full synthetic oil, which 
may have the likelihood of causing greater leaks in the engine, but it will also likely be able to circulate around the engine more readily and supplement that full synthetic oil with some sort of an additive that contains ZDDP, which is an anti-wear agent that oils used to have, but they no longer do for emissions reasons. You can find these types of additives on your local auto parts store shelves or online. In any case, hope you enjoyed this feature on one of the worst engines that GM has produced, the 3-liter LK9 carbureted V6. Thanks again for watching. Until next time, take care. Check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you.